Today's guitar is a personal guitar, sort of. Uh, this is for my son, who started making noise about wanting to play guitar. He said, I've been thinking about asking for an inexpensive, cheap guitar. So I found him one, except I didn't get a cheap guitar. I got an inexpensive, good guitar. And so we're gonna feature it today a little bit. This is a Martin DM. This one's from 1996, which means it's made in the USA. It's got a solid spruce top on it, and it's got mahogany uh, back and sides, which are actually kind of a laminate material, which is fine for a guitar like this because the laminate is more doable, you know. So I got this one on Reverb.com for 500 bucks. Pretty good guitar. I've had DMs before. So we're going to look at this one. We're going to see what kind of issues we're going to fix on this thing right away being a used guitar. So the first thing I noticed here, well, I, I saw this in the picture. It's got a pickup jack right here. And they put it here on the side, which is not terrible, you know, because it does let, allow you to leave your strap on and then have the pickup too. I would have probably drilled it up into here, into the end block. All right, we're gonna take a look at this and we're gonna see how they did it. I don't know what pick, kind of pickup it is yet, but we're gonna find out. The action on it was pretty good. Didn't need a whole lot there. The saddle height is pretty low, but it's got a pretty good brake angle, and we're gonna fix that. Um, you know, I could do a neck reset on it, but it's not really necessary for this guitar yet. The other thing I see right off the bat that I don't really like <clears throat> are these bone pins, bone bridge pins. I'm not a big fan of bone bridge pins, um, especially on an inexpensive guitar like this because inexpensive guitars tend to be bright and every bridge I've ever cracked has had bone bridge pins in it. Plus these are white and there's nothing white on this guitar so it looks kind of out of place. It's got black binding on it. It's got, um, there's just nothing white on it. So we're gonna take a look at this and I'll show you what modifications I'm going to make. Not a lot of modification. This one does have the tall back braces down there. And later on, I could shave those rear back braces. Um, I could let him do it too. You know, he builds knives. He's good at this stuff, you know. So here's the reason you want to do the back braces though. If you listen to the tap tone here. fairly consistent and if you were to shave the two rear back braces down to a pre-94 height of about three-eighths of an inch you would gain a little bit more bass and a little bit more richness the woof tone of the back would change and I've got a whole video on this on shaving back braces when you get into here it would go woof so woof and that's reflected a little bit in the sound Maybe not so much in a laminate back, but it's still there and it'll still make the guitar a little bit more lively. So let's take this apart, get these pins out of here, let's see what kind of pickup that is. I've already stuck a mirror in there real quick, so I'm a little bit ahead of you guys. <laughs> but I know we're probably gonna pick that pickup out. So I'm gonna get rid of these pins first of all, and then I'm gonna come back here and loosen this jack up. Then we're going to stick the GoPro inside the guitar and see what we got here. Right, move this over here. Strings off of it. Strings are in pretty good shape. I don't know if I'm going to change them yet or not. I think for a beginner that doesn't want to change strings, I'm definitely going to go with coated strings and they will tame the brightness of this guitar a little bit. It's a really bright guitar, <clears throat> which is not bad. I mean, you know, nothing wrong with that. But coated strings, um, like elixirs for dead areas, going to tame that brightness a little bit. It's funny that as much wear as there is on this, somebody was pretty heavy handed on that. It's funny that as much wear as there is, only the first three frets are worn. So it was just somebody beating the rhythm or maybe using a thumb pick and doing that. That's kind of, you know, 
Uh, let's stick the GoPro in the cam uh, inside. Let me get a light. <coughs> These uh, Nebo lights are fantastic for working on guitars. USB, cheap. Here we go. Alright, there's our pickup jack. I'm sure my voice is booming. It's coming up into the top here, so I know we have an undersaddled pickup. And what you should have noticed about that immediately is that they didn't clear the end block. So if you're going to drill it, either go through the end block like it's supposed to be, or clear the end block. And they didn't clear the end block on that. So, whatever. Sloppy job, you know. That's how it goes a lot of times. Okay, here's all this stuff. Pretty sure we're going to have an undersaddled fishman on this. And the reason we're going to take the undersaddle out is because it's basically a piece of cardboard. And the uh, saddle is sitting on a piece of cardboard. That's not great for time. It also means your saddle has to be a little bit looser. And he's not going to use a pickup anyways. So we're going to fish this out of here. And there you go, it's an undersaddle pickup, just like I knew it was going to be. I mean, you got a basically a piece of aluminum for it that your saddle is sitting on. That's not great for the tongue. So, we're going to put a solid saddle in. I might just shim that one. Now, you got to get this out of here, and these don't want to bend. You don't want to bend that one right there, or you'll break it. So, the easiest way to do this is to open this up. Right here. And I'm just opening it up to give me a little bit more wire to work with here so I don't cut too much wire. And then I'm going to pull the wire up like this. Which, like that, I'm just going to get a pair of clippers and we're going to clip it right there. The reason I'm going to clip it right there so that when you have the jack, you can still see how the wires went on. So if you decide to reshot this into something else, you can see where the wires go. Of course, I know that because the coax oh, it went away. <laughs> but the, the outside part, the coax part is the ground and then the black goes to the hot. And I know that, but a lot of people don't. So I always just cut them like that. And here's your pickup. I'm going to put that in the case and get rid of it. Okay, get my light back in here. Let's take a look inside the DM. Take a look at the construction. But once you notice in the DM, it's only got one torn bar back here. Okay, what we got from looking at that, the DM model only has one tone bar. The tone bar is the bar that runs across the top right here. Let me get my line out. The tone bar is the bar that runs across this way, and the DM only has one. Um, and it has a pretty big maple bridge plate that fell that up. It is an inexpensive guitar. The one I would like to get is actually a D1R. The D1R has two braces and the D16, the really good one is the D16. Um, the D16, what letter is it? An H, I think. A D16H is a very, very nice, inexpensive guitar. It's got the two tone bars, it's got scallop braces on it, um, etc. The one thing I really like about this though is the A frame bracing that you saw up in here. It's got two two braces that come up like this and no popsicle brace. Um, that's nice. Now, they're called tone bars. They're really just braces back here, but what they do, change the sound. So this guitar is gonna be a little bit thin and a little bit bright sounding. And I have put a second brace back here across the top um, through the sound hole. 
made my brace ready to go. It doesn't have to be exact, you know, but um, you put a second brace in here to make it more like a D16 and D18, the higher ones, and it'll richen the sound up a little bit more because it sends more vibrations across the top. That's the whole purpose of a tone bar and x bracing. It's not just to support the top, it's to send vibrations out into the top. And so not necessarily the more bracing you have, but the right kind of bracing can make a difference. I used to have a 1975 uh, D18, and when it came into me, it was missing either the first or the second tone bar, I don't remember which. And somebody had obviously like taken it out to make it sound better, and it didn't sound better, and I glued a second brace back in there, and man, psh, you know, richened it right up. So, there's some modifications. I've already done, I've already told you about the back braces. So if you did the back braces, and you put the second tone bar back in there, and did a few things to the bridge, you could improve this guitar quite a bit. Of course, if you're paying me to do it, you probably double the value, of, or double the investment in the guitar. So it's generally not worth it. I generally try to just do just what you really need on this. But since it's our guitar, um, and I might do that later on, since it's our guitar, it doesn't cost me any money to do this kind of thing because it's educational experience. So we'll see. Now, this saddle here is my Carter. And I can tell by looking at it, by the color and the flex. It's kind of a soft material. It's not necessarily a terrible saddle for a guitar like this because, again, this is a bright guitar because of the bracing, because of the back bracing, because of the construction of the thing, and <laughs> that's a car on the street. <laughs> My inclination on this is going to be to shim this saddle up with a piece of hot rosewood, um, basically to take the place of this pickup here, because I like the, I like the action with this, and this pickup is gonna be about 30,000 of an inch, 45,000 of an inch. So my inclination on this is going to be to super glue a piece of 45 thousandths of an inch hot rosewood, which I have lots of pieces sitting over here. These are cut off of bridges. This is a bridge that I uh, took off some wood because the blank was too thick. And so my inclination is going to be to glue this on there, 45 thousandths of an inch. And the thin edge is 43,007 inch. So there you go. I mean, that's almost perfect. So I'm gonna super glue this onto here. And I'm just gonna make a wooden shim. This is Grenadillo Rosewood. And so that's a great wood. Makes a great shim. There's nothing wrong with the shim if you glue it on here, make a nice tight fit. There's no difference between the shim and the bridge, you know, at that point. I could glue this into the bottom of the saddle slot and you would never even know it was there. But I'm going to glue it under the um, under the saddle. So I'm going to do that in a minute. And the second thing we're going to do is put some real bridge pins in here. These are ebony bridge pins, <clears throat> which are pretty good because they'll again tame the haws a little bit, and they don't quite fit. So I'm going to ream them. Ebony bridge pins that are matched black. These are also non-slotted, so I'm going to slot the bridge. I have a video on slotting the bridge. These this bridge is ramped, but it is not slotted. If you look closely into the holes here, you've got a ramp right here, which controls the brake angle, but the actual slot inside here is not slotted. So I'm going to slot that so that we can use non-slotted bridge pins, and there's lots of advantages to that, which I probably have another video on. I do have a video on slotting bridges that explains all that. The two saws that I'm going to use, um, the Stumac saw that you can buy, and then there's this one that I made from a saber saw blade that looks just fine. Open it up, use an unslotted pin, and in order to get that to fit like this, it's not fitting, I use a pinhole reamer. This is the one from Philadelphia Luthery. Just got this in. These are out of stock for a long time. Five degree taper. And the way you do that, you just drop it in there. Twist it back and forth. And it's not going to take much. Boom. And we're done. So I'm going to slot it. Fit the pins. 
put a shim on that, put it back together, and we're going to come back and take a look at it. And what about this hole? Probably we're not going to do anything with that hole. <laughs> it's a sound port. And it's also useful for looking inside the guitar. I mean, that's kind of cool. I could put, later on, I could put, go ahead and cut a circular piece of wood and put it in there. And plug that hole, but it's really not going to cause any issues. Um, you can definitely see, I can see the plywood on here. And I don't think I can get it onto the camera. But looking on the edge right here, you can see that it's plywood laminate <laughs> which is what plywood is and like I said before there's nothing really wrong with that um, a guitar like this it's meant to be a road guitar a sturdy guitar a student guitar a less fragile guitar this is never going to crack because it's uh it's got grains around in different directions so I'm going to do this work and then we're going to come back and string it up and play a little bit okay I like DMs um, I think they're really good value and you know they, they sell for four or five hundred bucks even now i used to buy them all day long for three to four hundred dollars and that's what i would recommend for students because it is a martin it's made in the usa martin saw this push top they play good they have a decent neck on them they have a bolt on neck so it's not too ter terribly hard to reset um don't think i've reset a dm i've shaved bridges down a little bit this one looks good but basically you just get it and get it set up to where the play is good. You make a few small corrections like the pins. You get a good bone saddle in there, bone nut. You know, you just get a good setup on it and then leave it alone. Because you don't really spend a lot of money. It's not going to respond the way the higher end guitars like a D18 or a D28 will. Because they have a higher grade spruce top and you know. Just all that stuff. So I don't like to go whole hog on this because it's our guitar and we're going to use it. As a, we can use it as a test mule. Someday I might put that second brace in there. I might shave the rear back braces. Um, I might turn my son loose on this and tell him to do it. You know, we'll see. So I'm going to do these things and then we'll be back. Well, I got all that done. It took me 15, 20 minutes or so. Here's the saddle with the shim. No big deal, huh? Super glued on there. You have to shave it down a little bit. You got to shave it. But it was a good thing to do because the saddle bottom was not quite square. So I squared it off, glued it back into here, and then squared this. So now this is all going to be nice and square. And we're going to pop it in there. There we go. Got all the pins fit. Pop, they drop in there and also when I was checking it out I checked the nut slot height no good that nuts either been adjusted um, someone got lucky I bet they were adjusted it's a Corian nut Corian is a countertop material it's not bad you know I'm not gonna be in any rush I think you know bone nut and bone shadow would be a little bit brighter down the road, but we'll deal with that later. Let's see if it gets used. Putting these in, and again, once again, the way to put a slotted, way to put strings in a slotted bridge is to put the string in about, put the ball in about halfway, like this, and then you take your pin and you push it down while you put a little tension on it. You hear it pop gets that ball in tied up against the bridge peg, which is the, a lot of the purpose of doing this. If you ever see your pin move up when you tighten the string, then the string is grabbing and pulling the pin up and that's not what you want. Okay, this one's not quite fitting. I need to make that slot just a little bit deeper or wider. Let's find out. It needs to be a little wider. I can tell by looking at it. So I'm using my shaver saw. This isn't gonna take too long. Just gonna widen that slot a little bit. It's really close. Put the pin ball about halfway, take the pin, push it down, and boom, we're in. <clears throat> yeah. 
You don't have to get too picky about making the slot fit the string exactly because after you do this a few hundred times, um, the, the, the string will mold the slot. You know, just the pressure of the slant string the habit. String the sucker up. See the A went nice. B's going in. some kind of 80-20 strings not the Adario because they don't have colored ball ends but they're still in good shape so we're going to use them for a while This has enclosed tuner heads, which I generally would replace on a high end guitar. I would replace it with open back tuners. On this guitar, it's not really worth doing. And these at least have the small buttons on them. They have the small buttons. So that's not bad, you know. You can replace those with ebony buttons and they look really good. But, you know, again, you can way overspend what this, what this guitar is worth. And we don't want to do that. We just want to get it up and operating, get it done quickly and cheaply. And it still sound good. I mean, the main thing is it plays good, sounds pretty decent. Sure when I really get to tuning it, um, I use my phone most of the time. This is a good app. Let me put a plug in for this app. I don't get any money or anything like this. It is called Strobe Tuner Pro. It's nice. I like it a lot. I use, it's great having it on your phone. Then you go into the guitar store or something, and you've got a Strobe Tuner. We're going to get the final tune up and we're going to give this thing a little run here, a test run. good I like it 500 bucks you know good guitar 
Um, okay, certainly good enough to learn. I'm going to check the relief one more time to see if I can drop the relief just a tiny bit. Because I feel like the action is just a smidgen high right now, which we're going to measure. And remember, I just popped that in after putting a shim in it. And I didn't measure it exactly and that kind of thing. I just did a quick setup. Let's take a 90,000th of an inch. Yeah, it's just a little high. It's 96. I don't really want to drop the saddle anymore. I've got a little bit of neck relief in here. Oh, yeah, quite a bit. We can, we can take... You shouldn't use the neck relief to adjust the action. But if it's on the upper end of the parameter, it will definitely affect the action. And that's all we're going to do here. Drop that relief just a minute. Yeah, let me find. Should be a five millimeter. I think this is back in here. No. 96 trust rod now. Yeah, it's back in there. There it is. I think it feels a little funny. Let me check that with a flashlight. Feels like I missed the nut. And uh, <clears throat> you can miss the nut and put the right, the wrench in between. Huh, we're good. I got it. I don't advise tweaking it until you're pretty confident you're on there. I think that's where a lot of mistakes are made is people think they're on and they're not. Oh yeah, that's pretty loose. You can do this with the strings on, there's no problem with that, it's just that the strings get in the way. I'm trying to get the right angle on this thing. There we go. Check it again. Good Dropped it. Yeah. Oh yeah. It's it's below ninety. We'll leave it there. My mom will go the more. The 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 nut is really loose, so we don't want that nut rattling around or anything. So we'll go one more tweak. What that means, uh, yeah, the many of my videos, but maybe it's the first time you've seen this. We're checking the neck relief by holding the first fret, just quick relief, it's a quick check, and down here at the 12th fret. And I'm looking at this gap right here. But that gap is eight thousandths of an inch, it could be half. If you drop the relief down more, make that neck flatter, the action goes down lower, and you might be able to put a taller saddle in here to bring it back up to increase that so that's all part of the setup you do the nuts the nut first then the relief actually you could do the relief first and then do the nut slot and then you check this one and so sometimes you have a what you think is a high action and it's just because the truss rod is not adjusted properly and after you adjust it to where it's nearly flat you may find out you can use a taller saddle than you were doing before or you can get the action down in the place where you can play it so you've got to check all that stuff first you got to do the relief first and then the nut and then then the saddle yeah Still got just a little bit of relief, which is good. 
And I bet that action's down quite a bit now. <clears throat> it's got a good healthy saddle by it. Good enough. Oh yeah. <laughs> we dropped it from over 90 to about 78 thousandths of an inch. And 78 thousandths of an inch is a very, is a pretty low, comfortable action. So after my kid gets to playing a little bit and gets comfortable with the fingering and everything, we might put a taller saddle in there and give it just a little bit more of the, of the desired saddle bite. So, so that's good. So that means it definitely, it doesn't need an equity shot. It's just a matter of getting that, getting everything set right. So you set the, set the relief, set the nut, and then see what your action is, what do you need to do with the saddle. In this case, we could actually bump that saddle up a little bit more. I could use a thicker shim, and I could just make a new saddle. The brake angle is pretty healthy right now. I'm not going to mess with it. I'm just going to give it to him like this, and you got a real super nice, low, comfortable action now. Yeah. I mean, that play is so much better than it did just a minute ago, and it wasn't bad a minute ago, but it's like butter now. So. <laughs> A little low for me, actually. <laughs> so, all right, so there we go, DM. Ready to go. Just a matter of getting the basic setup, getting the running condition good, changing his pins out, slider bridge. Boom, ready to go. Future modifications might be to do the back braces, possibly put a second um, tone bar in there. Uh, bone saddle, maybe the bone nut. That's it. You know, leave it alone and play it. So, good guitar. See you later.